Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good, good. You sound great. We are so excited to be back in our, our little home building here. I hope that you were able to attend our Easter celebration last week. It was such an amazing time. So much hard work went into that, and we got to see not only many faces from here at Bridge, but so much of the community came out to celebrate that wonderful day um, of Christ's resurrection. And uh, today we're going to jump right back in to a sermon series we were in before we left uh, for Easter entitled Red Letters. Now, uh, this entire series is taken from those letters which in many of our Bibles, uh, those letters that represent Jesus' words, His commands, his direction for life, that again, in many of our scriptures, not every Bible, are written in red ink. Now, it's probably accurate to say that some things in the Bible are just really complex. I don't know if you've ever sat down and you're like, I'm going to read through the Bible. And you get a few verses in and it's like, what happened with the angels and people having <laughs> giant kids? Like, what is going on? Some of you are like, I've never read that. And like, Genesis 6, a little crazy. There's a lot of that in the Bible. Like, there's all these things that happen that we can honestly say, you know, Lord, what were you, like, what do you want me to get out of this? And then there's the rest of Scripture. Because you see, a lot of the Bible, as soon as you read it, you're like, yep, I get it. It's pretty black and white. It is right there to understand. There's no hidden meanings. It's just really hard to do. Have you ever gotten to that part in your Bible and you're like, yeah, I get it, but there's no way I can do that. If you take Jesus' commands, his red letters, many of them can be broken down into those two same categories. Jesus would say things, and literally his own disciples would pull him aside later around the campfire, and they're like, okay, look, what did you mean by that? Like, that doesn't make any sense, and he would explain it to them. But then there were these other times when Jesus would say something so clear, so black and white, that there was no hidden meaning, there was no way it could mean anything but what he said and while it was clear, it was obviously clear, too, that it was really hard to do. And that's where we're going to be today. Today's red letters is going to represent something that Jesus said at a special sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. Maybe you've heard that before, maybe you haven't, but there was this day that a huge crowd surrounded him. And so the Bible teaches that Jesus walked up on a high place, up on a mount, and began to teach from that high place. And the things that he said that day changed the way people lived. It changed the understanding of how to live out your day-to-day -day walk that people had been in the midst of for hundreds of years. It was one of the things that he said that day that I believe may have caused some people to just turn on their heels and walk away. Like, I understand what you're saying, Jesus, but that's not possible. I can't do that. In fact, it's in Matthew chapter 5, within the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus said this, you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies? Love your enemies? Now, it's worth mentioning here that the Greek language that this scripture is written in contains many words for love. The Greek language is so rich and gives us the ability to understand exactly what someone means by love. In the English language, we love our wife and we love pizza. Right? It's like, what do you mean? How do you love? You? But in the Greek, there was these rich, like at least five different words for love that could have been used. Of all the Greek words, agape is the highest order. It is the, the highest plane of love, the most powerful. It's agape love that the Apostle John uses in the famous John 3.16 when he writes, for God so agape loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This word for love describes care and compassion that is 
unconditional, unearned, and is given whether it's deserved or not. We might assume that Jesus would have used some lesser Greek word for love when it came to our enemies. But then when you read the verse in the Greek, Jesus used agape for the love we're supposed to have for those people that we often hate. Listen again as Jesus makes this same command with a little more detail in Luke chapter 6. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great and you'll be truly acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Now, it might be easier if Jesus would have just kept this command real generic. Like, love your enemies, and then I get to decide how to define it. But then Jesus begins to give his command real detail on how to carry it out. Detail that honestly makes me really uncomfortable. Using Jesus' words that we just read in Luke, let's look at how he defines loving your enemies. First, he says, pray for those who persecute you. Now, I don't know about you, but I fail to pray for the people that I love on a daily basis as I should. And now you're telling me I need to not only pray for them, but for my enemies? You mean that little list that I have where I write down the names of people I genuinely care for that have cancer, that are struggling with children, that need new employment, those people I genuinely love and take the time to pray for. I'm supposed to create a little section in there for my enemies? Friends, I again could pray better for the people I love. How do I find it within myself to begin to pray for those people that make my life so hard? I know. I've figured out a way. I'll just bow my head and, Lord Jesus, I want to pray for Tom. Father, I pray that you would strike him with a bolt of lightning for the way he's been treating me this week. In Jesus' name, amen. But that's not what Jesus has in mind. <laughs> I believe that Jesus legitimately wants us to pray that they are blessed, restored, forgiven. From here it gets even harder. Jesus doesn't just stop at praying for our enemies. He also commands us to do good to them. Now look, I can pray for my enemies in private and they don't see it and I can still give them the stink eye in person. <laughs> But how do I do good to my enemies without them feeling like they're being rewarded for their bad behavior? It's almost like Jesus expects me to love these irritating people while they're mistreating me. Can you take a minute and picture that person, the one that makes your life so hard, the one that when you replay the conversations in your mind, you can get angry weeks, months after the issue actually took place? Do you see their face? Now picture yourself making them a plate of cookies. The good ones. <laughs> the one that you take grandma's recipe and you buy the best ingredients and you lovingly make it while you see their little smiling faces in your mind. Imagine making that plate for your enemies. Then imagine walking out your door and down the street to their house, knocking on the front door and imagine walking into their office on Monday morning with that plate full of love and delivering it in genuineness. Friends, this is getting serious. Now, one of my biggest concerns about this sermon is that all of a sudden somebody here is going to receive a plate of cookies. <laughs> Love is going to sweep through the audience and people are going to be getting cards and cookies all over the place. If you start getting some snacks, you may want to double check that relationship. <laughs> like, are we good? Because I thought we were good. Just take them. <laughs> you know, just take them. But even then, Jesus still isn't finished. 
I wonder if he threw in this next defining command just in case we weren't getting his drift with the first two. Because here Jesus adds to praying and doing good to our enemies, lend to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid. What? This is too much. Imagine a world where our enemies can ask things of us and we are not only to give them to them, but we're not to expect them to, be ever, to ever be returned. You know that person in the office that borrows your stapler? It ain't never coming back. <laughs> you know it's never coming back and it just makes you angry. The person that borrows your tools, your gas for your lawnmower, these practical everyday things, Jesus says, just give it to them and don't even expect it to come back. Not to your friend, not to your loving family, but to your enemies. Friends, agape love requires a love and a care on a level that many of us aren't accustomed to giving to the people we care about, much less our enemies. But that is what Jesus is calling us to do. Now, I want to take a minute right here and take care of a little loose end. Somewhere, someone might be asking the reasonable question, why did we have to change from the Old Testament approach to loving our enemies? Why did we have to change from what God did in the Old Testament where people just got what they deserved? If an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was good enough for God in the Old Testament, then it's good enough for me. First, do any of us really want to live in an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth justice system? Now, most of us don't mind being on the giving end of cold, hard justice, but do we really want to be on the receiving end? Imagine sitting in your folding chair at one of those little early morning Saturday soccer games. Families lined up, watching their kids out, giving their best, you with your coffee, the dew still wet in the grass, chit-chatting, when all of a sudden in the middle of the game, little Jimmy, your little Jimmy, jumps up to head the soccer ball and instead takes out the tooth of an opposing player. Now, hey, right now those things happen. We feel terrible for the kid. We all clap for him when he gets up and walks off with a tooth in his hand. And then the game continues. But imagine an economy where before the whistle blows to join the game again, little Jimmy has to walk out to the center of the field and his tooth is extracted as well before the game restarts. Friends, if this is how we lived, we'd all look like the walking dead by this age. <laughs> Secondly, if we study the Old Testament, the Old Testament, you might be surprised to discover a very interesting truth about how God expected His people, even then, to live with their enemies. Listen to the words of Solomon found in Proverbs 25. If your enemies are hungry, give them food to eat. If they are thirsty, give them water to drink. You will heap burning coals of shame on their heads and the Lord will reward you. Now, it'd be easy to read this and think to ourselves, yes, where do I get in line to heap burning hot coals on my enemy's head? But notice the delivery method. If your enemies are hungry, give them food to eat. If they're thirsty, give them water to drink. Friends, this Old Testament love looks an awful lot like the love that Jesus expects us in the new he expects us to agape, to genuinely love our enemies. Listen as God continues to define what the Old Testament approach to our enemies should be in Exodus 23, the second book in the Bible. If you come upon your enemy's ox or donkey that has strayed away, take it back to its owner. If you see that the donkey of someone who hates you has collapsed under its load, do not walk by, instead stop and help. Phew, I don't know about you, but I'm glad I don't have any neighbors with donkeys. 
this really doesn't apply to me, does it? But really, again, take a minute. And within your mind's eye, whose poster would hang in your mental post office as your enemy number one? Who is that person that genuinely frustrates you and it can last for weeks or months, even today. Can you see their face? Now imagine that you're traveling down Route 340 to Cracker Barrel. And they're sitting alongside the road in their broke-down Toyota donkey. <laughs> Staring at a flat tire is that person. That person. What are you going to do? What about when your crazy neighbor's animals stray over to your place and make a mess in your yard? Or you see them trotting down the road dragging their leash? I know what I want to do in those moments. But Jesus is calling us to a different place. Years ago, we had a neighbor. Sherry and I lived in a different community at the time. And we had a neighbor that had just free-roaming farm animals, giant crazy farm animals. He was crazy. And they would, every, every now and then, we would just find these animals in our yard making a mess. One of them was a 2,000-pound steer, massive animal. It just post-holed our yard whenever it got in. <laughs> just holes every, munching on the grass. Then it got, and we would chase it home. All right, we do what the Bible says. Chase it home. And then finally, it started eating the shrubs around the house. Then one day, and I was not here to experience it, I've only heard the story from my children. <laughs> my wife, who was working inside the house, heard a ruckus outside. The dog started barking. She opens our front door and is staring at this 2,000-pound bovine in the face. It had gotten on our porch, two feet up on the porch, rear legs in it. It was here that my little flute plan wife snapped. <laughs> my kids said all they remember is Sherry shouting back into the house, kids, get me a gun. <laughs> Fortunate for the steer and our legal troubles, they brought her an airsoft pistol, <laughs> fully loaded and ready to go. And from what they tell me, she got like gangster style and just... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what she said. I never asked. And she gently coaxed this animal back to its house. Now, wait, I can hear some of you saying, I'm not sure that's what Jesus meant. <laughs> but can I tell you who really blew it? Was your pastor. When I got home later and found out what happened, when I saw the damage... I marched out of our driveway down the street and up to his front door and I knocked on it. <laughs> My response was an abject failure of Christ's command to love my enemies. My Christian witness that day what I looked like as Christ in that moment was nothing like what he has called us to do. The Apostle Paul would say to me, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. This is such a hard formula to understand, isn't it? It seems like the verse should read something like, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by slaying it with the double-edged sword of the Lord. But no, somehow in an upside-down way, overcoming evil will be accomplished by responding to it with goodness. Now, this would be a great time to try and answer the question of why. Why should we love our enemies to begin with? Remember the Jesus words in Luke 6, then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will be truly acting as children of the Most High, for He is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. As I read this, I hear two different but amazing reminders. First, there is a reward for loving this way. God will reward you for loving your enemies in this way. Listen to the words of Jesus as He continues in Luke 6, 38. 
Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you'll be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you a good measure. Press down, shaken together and running over, pouring into your lap. For with the measure, listen to these words, for with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. This is one of the most amazing sentences in the Bible to me. If I will respond with mercy and agape love for my enemies, if I will refuse to judge them and condemn them, but instead forgive and bless, God will do the same for me. And how will that blessing be measured out in my life? Listen again to Jesus' words. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over and pouring into your lap. When we love those who have wronged us, God sees that love in action and responds with an overwhelming blessing on our behalf. Then this second reminder, what is the reward? What is this reward that will be pouring out and given in such great measure by God? What is it, what is it that we're receiving in such great volume, friends? That reward is grace. Wonderful, unmerited, undeserved, and amazing grace. Jesus is reminding you and I that as we stare down at our enemies, as the bitterness seeps into our hearts, frustrated and angry, as we ponder what we might say and do to our enemies if we ever got the chance, it's in the middle of this cold, hard tirade that Jesus just gently whispers this question. Are you sure you want only justice for your enemies? Is that how I responded to you? The sobering words of James come ringing true. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, it will make yourself an enemy of God. Church, according to God's word, all have fallen short of God's glory. Everyone in this room has sinned and at some point has fallen in love with the world. And do you realize that by doing that, every single person in this room has worn the title enemy of God? Do you remember the moment when God's light shone down into your heart and it became terribly evident to you just how dark and sinful your life really is? I can still remember the helpless feeling of guilt and shame in my own life when my past life played in front of me like some never-ending rated R movie. As I faced the true reality of my heart's depravity, that I was in fact an enemy of the Creator, did I for a moment cry out to Him for justice? When the Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans 6 that the wages of sin is death, and I realized that I was a sinner and that I deserved that just punishment, did I raise my fist and demand God's just penalty? Friends, when I stood before a holy God, guilty and condemned, my cry was not for justice, but for mercy, unearned forgiveness and grace. If God has so richly responded to my guilt and to yours with unmerited, overflowing grace, then as his children, shouldn't we respond the same way to our enemies? Remember, Jesus not only did nice things for his enemies, he died for them. He has raised the bar, he has set it high Listen to these amazing words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 5. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son while we were still His enemies, 
we will certainly be saved through the life of His Son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus has made us friends of God. Each Sunday here at Bridge, we remember this incredible moment where an innocent man died on a cross for his enemies. Friends, the greatest act of injustice that has ever happened was the moment that a sinless son of God was killed, murdered wrongly on a cross for people that didn't deserve it at all. And yet in that moment, the greatest act of injustice became the most amazing act of justice that I have ever received. And this little cup, This little meal that represents Jesus' blood and his body in that moment is a reminder of the tremendous love that has been poured out, agape love poured out for you when you had no ground to stand on. Father, as we take this meal today, we just want to come to you in humility and thankfulness that you loved us when we were your enemies in such a powerful way. Lord, I don't know how to love my enemies, but I want to be more like you. Would you pour your spirit, your attitude, your agape love so richly and deeply into us that its overflow would allow us to do the impossible? Father, thank you for all you've done and for this wonderful reminder today. Amen. The acclaimed writer and columnist Arthur C. Brooks recently wrote a book entitled Love Your Enemies, How Decent People Can Save America. It was in the book that he recounted the details of uh, one of his own experiences. He had uh, received an email one day from a man that had read one of his prior books, a book that he put a lot of work into, A Real Labor of Love. The email opened, Dear Professor Brooks, You are a fraud. And then went on for some 5,000 words, criticized in detail every chapter in the book and informed me of my numerous inadequacies as a researcher and even as a person. Brooks, stunned for a moment, was unsure of how to respond. There seemed to be three possibilities. Ignore the guy, insult him, or destroy him by picking out his errors and throwing him back in his face. But Brooks chose a fourth option. Instead of responding in anger, he decided to respond with thank you. Brooks acknowledged that although the man had hated his work, he was still genuinely thankful 
that the man had taken time to carefully read each chapter and finally the entire book. Brooks recounts that only minutes after sending the thank you, the man that had so harshly criticized him replied. To the author's complete surprise, the reply could only be described as friendly, even suggesting that the two get together sometime soon and talk more about the book, even suggesting the possibility that they could ever meet for dinner. Friends, sometimes we over-spiritualize Jesus' commands and we put them up into these great soaring areas when Jesus is calling us to get real practical with this one. Who are your enemies? I realize that sometimes it's the person that sleeps next to you, next to you in the bed. Sometimes it's the children down the hall. Sometimes it's a coworker, your boss, a neighbor. In some practical way, I believe Christ is calling you and I to be the light in our community by how we respond to those people that we would just as soon never see again. Somehow that kind of love is going to transform the world after all. It was by Jesus' example that the world has been transformed. So we're going to sing a song as we always do. And this isn't a complicated invitation. It's just a hard one. Within Jesus' command today, he said, would you pray for your enemies? I want to take the next five minutes while we sing. And whoever that face is, whoever that person is, would you honestly and heartfelt go to God on their behalf? Would you come to these steps and pray a heartfelt prayer for those people that have made your life miserable? We'll have prayer partners at each one of the, each one of the doors. We'd love to walk with you, pray with you in confidence for whatever journey you're going through and see God transform not only your heart, but maybe someone else's as a result. Won't you stand and won't you come as we say?
You can have a seat. Friends, I hope you'll remember from week to week just how much of an impact you're having. When you give here, we want you to know it's, just, it's not just to keep the lights on, to keep the grass mowed. You are impacting real lives of real people in this community and even around the globe. And we want to thank you for that. Uh, you are such a generous, generous people, and because of that, we're able to financially support organizations like Comfort Care Women's Health, who come alongside mothers in a season where they may not be real sure what to do with their pregnancy, and they give great, godly, Christ-centered, loving advice, supportive advice to those people. One of their largest events is a Stride for Life. We actually have a table in the hallway today. We'd love to have you stop by there and learn more about how you could get involved with this critical ministry, especially at a time now where children's lives really are in question and in doubt in much of our country. So would you consider doing that? And again, thank you for the many ways that you give with your time, your talent, your energy, and of course, with your finances, it is making a huge difference. Can I pray for today's offering? Father, thank you for the generosity that is in the hearts of these friends. God, it is your heart. That is why I believe we give you all the credit and the glory for the goodness that is happening here. It's by your power and your spirit alone. Would you continue to pour into us a heart of generosity so that we can be a light to our community and our world? In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, thank you so much for being here. It means so much. We hope you have a great week, and we'll see you here next time. Good job. Awesome.
Hallo.
Good morning. How you guys doing? Hope you had a good week. Once you're staying with us, let's sing together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb. Till I met you. Come on. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name and I ran out of that Now your freedom is all that I know. Come on. The old made new. Oh, Jesus, when I met you. Oh, what a day when you called my name. And I ran out of that grave. story. This is my story. Let's sing it together. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my hope you had a good week and enjoying the weather, except for those of you with allergies, like myself. If this is your first time with us, we'd love to get to know you. And if you got an orange card when you came in, please fill it out and Bring it to our uh, meeting room A on the way out. You'll see it on your right after the service. And uh, we have a free gift for you just for being here. 
And if this isn't your first time with us, welcome back. We're so glad that you chose to be here with us this morning on this beautiful day. Back from Expo, now we're back in our regular building. Back to normal, I guess. But as we continue in worship together, let's lift up our voices. I know your love is strong enough to meet me where 